Hey, good morning, and uh, thank y'all for tuning in this morning. Um, I'm going to start off with a, a few questions. Um, have you ever felt that no matter what you did, no matter what you do, no matter how much you tried, no how much you struggled to get ahead, it was hopeless? Have you ever looked around and watched as others seem to get ahead, yet nothing ever worked for you? You take care of your health, and you still get sick. All the while, the, the, the person down the street um, does anything they want to do. They, they do everything that the doctor tells them not to do, and they stay healthy. You work and you save and you try to get ahead, but the bills, they just continue to pile up and pile up and pile up. All the while, your neighbor down the street, the same neighbor, uh, he lives life like a party and never seems to go without. Or maybe you pray for that family member, that friend, that loved one, yet you never see any changes in their life or maybe even their condition. Sometimes it seems that no matter what you try to do, that all the cards are stacked against you. Right? Forget the light at the end of the tunnel because you can't even find the tunnel. Does that sound familiar? Let me tell you right now. There is not a person alive who hasn't experienced frustration at one time or another in their life. There isn't a person alive who hasn't known pain. That hasn't known discouragement. But as with all the other problems in our life, if you're a Christian, God is always there for you. God will give you help. God will give you hope when everything in this life seems hopeless. That's the title of today's message. Hope when things seem hopeless. Let's open with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for your promises. I thank you that you're God and we are not. That we, you're always there for us to turn to in times of need. But also there for, you're always there for us. When we just want to thank you and say thank you. Thank you, Daddy. Lord, thank you for the hope that you give us day to day. Thank you that we're that you're a God that we can turn to when everything seems like it's going wrong. And you're always there with your arms wide open and a hand out to say, come to me. Lord, I thank you for that. I thank you for the Holy Spirit, the guidance of the Holy Spirit, the direction of the Holy Spirit. And I pray for the Holy Spirit's guidance and direction in our life today, just in this time that I'm speaking, that the person, each person is listening or watching can get what you want them to get. In Jesus' name, amen. If you've got your Bibles with you, do me a favor. Let's go ahead and turn to Jeremiah 33. I'm going to read verses 1 through 4. Jeremiah 33, once, uh, 1 through 4. Let me read it to you. It says this, While Jeremiah was still confined in the courtyard of the guards, the word of the Lord came to him a second time. This is what the Lord says. He who made the earth, of, excuse me, he who made the earth, the Lord who formed it and established it, the Lord is his name. Call to me, and I will answer you and tell you great and mighty things that you do not know. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says about the house and the city and the royal places of Judah that have been torn down to be used against the siege ramps and the sword. Let me stop right there. Now, I've been studying the book of Jeremiah in my personal devotions, and I wish that I had the time this morning to take you through the entire book of Jeremiah. But I know that's not possible. So this morning, I want to take a look, and I want to talk 
about my, one of my favorite verses in the entire Bible, which talks about hope. I want to talk about Jeremiah's hope in a hopeless situation. Now, if you and I were to go back, and we're going to read through the pages of this book of Jeremiah, we would find that Jeremiah, you know, he has lived a pretty tough life. It's not been easy. For over 40 years, he's served as the counselor, a confidant, advisor, if you will, to kings in Israel. But get this, they don't listen to him. Imagine that. You're tasked to help people. You're tasked to help the king, but they don't pay attention to what you're saying. And Jeremiah's a prophet, okay? God speaks to him so he can in turn tell the people what God is saying. And they don't listen. And everything that Jeremiah has been telling the king and the people up until this point, is now coming true. You see, up until now, up until all scripture reading, Jerusalem is now surrounded. Babylonian armies, they've surrounded the city. Their armies are lined up as far as the eye can see. And they've started to tear down the homes that are outside the walls. And they're using these materials to build ramps to get inside the fortified city. Now imagine with me. Imagine this. You and your family, you've got the word that the Babylonian armies were on their way. They're coming to your city to wage war. And you live outside the city walls. So you get word that they're on the way and you pack your family up as fast as you can and you get inside the city. You get inside those fortified walls. And when you're inside the city, you climb up to the top of the wall to look over. And when you're there, you see the armies approach. And they come in and then you watch as they tear down your home. And they start using your material of that home for ramps so they could get in to the city. You're trapped. You can't go anywhere. And as, as you watch this unfold, you know it's not going to be long before the fortified city, the city that you love, the city of Jerusalem was now going to fall. And after Jerusalem, then Judah's going to fall. Jerusalem in the south, Judah in the north, makes up the nation of Israel. And then after those fall, the entire nation of Israel will fall. Oh, and let me tell you this. I left out a really key, important part. Do you know how long it took for the Babylonian army who get on site to start to build, tear down these houses, to build and to conquer the city. You know how long it took? It is not like Jericho. What didn't happen in a few days? It took two and a half years. You don't want to talk about psychological warfare. You get up every single morning, and you look out, and the Babylonian army is there day after day, after day, week after week, month after month, for two and a half years. Can you imagine the hopelessness that these people are feeling? Can you imagine knowing that you are trapped inside this city? This army is all the way around you. They're going to do, they're doing this. They're out there for two and a half years. You can't run. You can't hide. And by the way, now you're starving to death. Where's your hope? And where is Jeremiah in all this? This great man of God. Where, what happened to Jeremiah? Where's he at? Well, Scripture tells us this morning that 
Jeremiah's in jail. He's locked up. Verse 1 says he's shut up in the the guard's courtyard. He's in prison. You see, the leaders of Jerusalem, they got tired of hearing Jeremiah preach. They knew he was a prophet of God. They knew he spoke words from God. They got so tired of hearing him warn them about God's judgment, about what was going to happen that they're dealing with right here and now that they put him in prison. They got so tired of hearing him tell them that this very thing was going to happen. So they put him in prison. Innocent Jeremiah. Doing everything that he possibly could do for God. And they put him in prison and lock him up. See, they're hoping, these people, these rulers, these leaders, these Jews, they're hoping that he won't hear from God now because he's in prison. These people, these rulers, they don't want to hear what God is telling Jeremiah, so he in turn tells them. They don't want to hear it. These silly people. Silly, silly people. No confinement can deprive God's people of his presence. No locks, no bars can shut out his voice or his visits. You see, it's in things are the darkest. When there is no hope or help in sight that God often visits his people. Tell me. When did an angel first visit Daniel? Wasn't it when he was in the lion's den? When did Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego see the Son of God? Wasn't it in that fiery furnace? When did an angel visit Peter? Wasn't it when he was in prison? Sometimes... God allows discouragement. Sometimes God allows disappointment. Sometimes God allows discouragement and disappointment and frustration just to cause us to turn to him. Just because you do just because to, to call you to be receptive to his voice and his visit. You've heard me tell you this for the last couple of weeks. God is always talking to you. And sometimes he needs to get your attention so you will hear his voice. I don't know what's zapping your strength this morning. What has you concerned? What has you losing sleep? I don't know what has you running Trying to bury yourself in work or maybe even in recreation just so you don't have to face whatever it is. I don't know what has you overwhelmed, what has you worried. But friend, let me tell you something, whatever it is, I believe God's got a word for you this morning. You see, the same request, the same command, and the same promise that God gave Jeremiah thousands and thousands of years ago also applies to us today. Take a look at verse 3. Let me read it to you again. Call to me. This is God. God saying, telling Jeremiah, Call to me and I will answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things that you do not know. Do you hear the command in that? And it starts off, God says, Call to me. There's a command. Call to me. And then there's two great promises. Call to me is the command. The promise is, I will answer you and I will show you great and mighty things that you do not know. Now think about the situation that Jeremiah is in. Jeremiah is in the city, which is surrounded by a huge army. Babylon has already begun building ramps to get inside, to invade that city. Inside that city, hunger 
Starvation has already set in. They're cut off from their farms. They're on the outside of that wall. The people are worried. They're frantic. They're hopeless. They're beside themselves. And now, not only is Jeremiah in a town in a terrible situation, but he is in prison in that town. If there was anybody that ever should be without hope, it's Jeremiah. If there's anyone who should ever be in despair or discouraged, it was Jeremiah. But in the middle of it all, in the middle of all of that, God issued a command. He tells Jeremiah this. Here's the command. Call unto me. Call unto me. What did God ask Jeremiah to do when he was at wit's end? What did God ask Jeremiah to do when things seemed helpless and hopeless? God just simply said this. Call unto me. Call unto me. In other words, God's saying, pray, pray. God told Jeremiah, just as he told you and me, pray when things seem dark, when the horizon is cloudy, when there seems like there is no hope. When that happens, pray. Let me tell you what our world is lacking right now. Prayer. Let me tell you what our country's lacking right now. Prayer. Let me tell you what our families are lacking right now. Prayer. You mean tell you what the church as a whole is lacking right now. Prayer. God's telling us that we need to be in prayer. We need to be calling on him. But God doesn't stop there. He also gives us some promises in the scripture. It's promises that is so important, so great, that God signs the promise with his own name. You say, what are you talking about, Donnie? Take a look at verse 1 and 2. Let me read you verse 1 and 2 again. While Jeremiah was still confined in the courtyard of the guard, the word of the Lord came to him a second time. This is what the Lord says. He who made the earth, the Lord who formed it and established it, the Lord is his name. Four times. Four times he signs his name to it like a name on a contract. Guaranteeing that it will be performed. This is no wimpy little God making wimpy little promises. This is Yahweh. This is the creator of heaven and earth. This is the one who made you and I and everything. This is our rock. This is our refuge, our fortress, our shield, our king, our judge, our shepherd. This is Abba, Father. He is the great I am. The king of kings, the Lord of lords, that God. That God, the God who created the heavens and the earth, the God who formed man out of the dust of the earth, that God sent his son to die for you and me. And he made us promises. He gave us a promise. You say, Donnie, what's that promise? Verse three says, I will answer you. He gives us a command. Call on me. And then he gives us a promise and I will answer you. God promises to answer our prayers. He's saying, I'm listening for your prayers. He's saying, I'm waiting for your prayers and I'm going to answer your prayers. Now, let me give, just give you a little disclaimer really, really quick. He will answer your prayers, but it's not always going to be the way you want them answered. Just so you know that. But let me tell you something. He will answer your prayers no matter what. It's not like he's looking at his caller ID on his phone when he gets that call and he's like, oh, oh not going to answer that one. I'm leaving that one alone. No. 
You pray, He will answer. He tells us that. He gives us that promise. The almighty, all-knowing, ever-present God, He knows everything. He knows when it's you calling. And He knows this before you even call out to Him. God says, call on me. I'm going to listen and I'm going to answer. But he doesn't stop there with that promise. He makes another promise. He says, I'm going to show you great and mighty things that you do not know. He's going to show you things beyond your imagination. Beyond your comprehension. And I believe that this promise... This promise here is meant for three groups of people. And I want to talk about it this morning. That very first group of people that he's talking to, those who do not know him yet. Unbeliever. God makes this people promise to, his peop- to the people who haven't made him their Lord and Savior. Perhaps some of you are sitting there, you're watching this or you're listening. And you have never accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. You haven't invited Him into your heart. You have never told Him, Jesus, I'm tired of living my life my own way. And I'm tired of being defeated. Please, Lord, forgive me and come into my heart. Chances are, if that's you, you might even have a hard time understanding why would anybody do that? I mean, after all, isn't Christianity just a bunch of uh, rules and regulations? Won't that just cramp my style? Please listen closely. You listening? You will never understand joy. You will never understand peace. You never understand how great life can really be. Until, until you step out in faith and say, Jesus, I give all I know of me to all I know of you. You see, before you do that, before you say that, it will seem foolish. You say, what are you you getting at, Donnie? Why would you even say that? That's what the Bible tells us. See, 1 Corinthians 2, 14 says this. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. For they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them. Because they are spiritually discerned. You see, as a Christian, you're a spiritual being living in a physical world. But if you're an unbeliever... You're not a spiritual being yet. So you're not going to get it. In other words, the Bible is saying you're never going to understand how great it is to be a Christian. You're never going to understand how great it is to give Jesus Christ control of your life until you do it. You're not fully going to get it. You're not fully going to understand it until you give your life to Christ. So you're not making sense, Donnie. Well, let me ask you this. How can you explain love to someone who's never been in love? How can you describe beauty to someone who's never seen? How, you, how can you describe a child's laughter to someone that's never heard? How can you describe being full to someone that has never had enough to eat? You can't. You see, until you turn your life over to Jesus Christ, there's no way that you're truly going to get it. Not until after you've accepted that gift. I can't actually describe to you how great life is going to be until you accept that gift. Until you ask Christ into your heart. Now, I'm going to do everything possible. We as believers should do everything possible about sharing that good news. But until the Holy Spirit convicts your heart and you accept Christ as your personal Savior, you won't understand how great life can be. 
you're searching and you're searching and you're searching for something that only God can give you. And you won't totally understand what that truly is until after you've accepted it. That's what that is saying in our scripture today. Showing you great and mighty things that you cannot understand. And John 6.37 tells us, The one who comes to me I will never cast out. Listen, Jesus will never turn you down. Jesus will never turn you down if you call on him. And God will show you great and mighty things that you did not know. God makes the promise to those, to those who do not know him yet. That brings me to the second group of people that God makes this promise to. Those who are discouraged by their circumstances. A lot of us fill, fill in to this category. Those who are discouraged by their circumstances. Now, Jeremiah, he was a faithful man. He never quit trusting God. He was an obedient man. He went and he did everything that God told him to do. Yet in spite of Jeremiah's faith, in spite of Jeremiah's obedience, he still had difficulties. He still had to go through hard times. There's some people out there with a mistaken idea that if you become a Christian, that if you turn your life over to Christ, that you won't have difficulties, that you won't be discouraged from that day forward. That everything from then on will be hunky-dory. Let me tell you something. That's a bunch of nonsense. God never said that there wouldn't be difficulties, that there's not going to be discouragements if you become a Christian. What he did promise, what he did promise, is that he would go through those hard times with you and then use them for your benefit. As well as his. Let me tell you this story really quick. There was a young boy. And he was watching a butterfly struggle to escape from a cocoon. You may have heard this. And he thought that he would help out this little butterfly. He thought that he would tear the cocoon just a little bit. So he could help that butterfly get out. But what he got though was a butterfly that was weak and trembled and never was able to fly. See, the boy didn't realize that that butterfly, didn't to, he needed to struggle against that cocoon because it was in that struggle that pushed the fluids into his wings. It was the struggle that caused his wings to grow strong enough to fly. It was the struggle, or excuse me, without that struggle, he was helpless. This butterfly was hopeless. Without this struggle, he could not soar. God never promises to take the struggles out of our life. But he does promise to use them for our benefit. Romans 8, 28 says, All things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to His purpose. If you're in the middle of a struggle right now, if you're discouraged right now, if you're frustrated right now, if you feel like throwing in the towel, God promises relief. He says, Call on me. Let me show you things that you don't know. Let me show you how I'm working in your life. Let me take you by the hand and walk you through your troubles. You see, too many times we like to think that as a Christian, God is going to take us by our hand and walk us around our troubles. Take us around our problems. And God's saying, no. I'm going to take you by the hand. I'm going to walk you right through the middle of your problems. Right through the middle 
of your troubles. God wants to show you great and mighty things that you do not know. That brings me to the third group that God makes this promise to. Those who are serving Him now. Obedient Christians now. See, our enemy wants to keep obedient Christians discouraged. You get that, right? One of the easiest ways to get discouraged is by serving God and caring for people. I'm just being honest. That's what our enemy wants to do. He wants to keep us discouraged. Because why? Because you're making a difference for Christ. You love people. You care about people. And so you do everything you know to help them. You pray for them. You tell them about Christ and how Christ can make a difference in their life. You do everything you know, and yet you can't see anything happening. You can't see any changes. And they keep repeating the same mistakes over and over and over again. And it seems that nothing you do makes a difference. Maybe you've got a burden for the church. And so you pray and you pray and you pray, you witness, you visit, you do everything you know how to do, and yet you still can't see anything happening. You don't see any progress. You visit, you pray, you do everything you know how to do, and it seems like you're maybe wasting your time. To you who are faithfully, obediently serving God, and yet you're discouraged. God says this. Call unto me, and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things that you do not know. Let me tell you something. God is always at work, even when you can't see it. God has a calling on your life. We've been talking about that for the last four weeks. He's got a calling on your life and He is asking you to be obedient. Don't get discouraged by the things you don't see happening. Instead, get excited. Get encouraged by, the, by just knowing that God is at work in your obedience. If you're obedient, Hear me out. If you are obedient, then you know without a shadow of a doubt that God is at work in your life, even when you can't see things happening. Behind the scenes, God is at work in your life. And maybe you're discouraged because maybe because you haven't called out to God yet. In those moments of discouragement, in those times in your life where you're discouraged, let God show you great and mighty things that you do not know. Will you call out to Him this morning? Let's close in prayer. Oh, Heavenly Father, I thank you. Thank you for the command to call out to us, and thank you for the promises. The promise that you're going to answer our prayers and that you're going to show us great and mighty things that we do not know. Oh, what an awesome God you are. Thank you that you're God. Thank you that you love us. Thank you that you're at work in our life. Thank you that you're at work in this country and at this world, even at times when we do not see it. But we've got a promise. And we know that you want the best for us, that you're at work, that you're listening, you want to answer prayers, and that you want to show us some great stuff. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, life isn't easy. That's not going to be. But it's a lot better with the hope of Jesus Christ. Thank you all so much. Y'all have a blessed week.